Well, good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's feeling well. Hope you're having a good day. Beautiful day to be out. As I mentioned last week, and we're going along in the book, but one topic that, that's not in the book is the topic of giving. And I thought we, while we were where we were at talking about the Lord's Supper, we'd go on and spend a couple of weeks talking about that, the topic of giving, because the Bible has a lot to say about it. We'll begin with a word of prayer. And Brooks, would you leave some prayer, please? Well, when it comes to giving, the Bible has a lot to say about it. And the Gospels themselves, you'll find Matthew speaks about it 33 times. And Mark, 23 times. Luke speaks about it 53 times. John, 17 times. And really, in every book of the New Testament has something to say about giving. So if we go to the Bible and say, well, there's nothing there, we just haven't looked. And it's repeatedly, really it's the, uh, the uh, second most mentioned topic in the Bible outside of Jesus. So the Bible has a lot to say about it. And if God says a lot about it, we might want to give attention to it because there might be some important things I need to learn from it. But the topic of giving, at least in the church, is taught less than any other topic in the Bible. Now why would that be? Why do we teach less about it? than any other topic in the Bible. Well, one reason, we don't like people telling us how to spend our money. We don't like that. And as we go through this lesson, I'm not telling you. I'm trying to tell you what God says. This is not me talking. This is trying to get across what God has put before us here as to uh, even to how much, the attitude we should have toward it, what we should do about it. Uh, from that standpoint. So we just don't like people telling us how to spend our money. Some people will say, well, as long as the congregation is meeting the budget, why should I, I be concerned about it? Well, good question. Uh, as I said last week, you know, sometimes when you have lessons on giving, the contribution drops. Because it makes somebody mad. That's not going to happen here, is it? That's not going to happen here. Because we're going to take God's word as what it says. We're going to take it with the right attitude and learn from it and try to better ourselves for it. I don't know if you ever heard V.P. Black tell his story before, but he talked about the first church he worked at full time. Where he preached, well, the first, it wasn't the first Sunday he was there, but at some point he preached on giving. And after he preached on giving, he called him the ramrod, came up and fired him that day. The first lesson he gave on giving, he got fired. So it's not a, uh, it's not a welcome topic, but yet it's one that the Bible speaks of that we need, we need to hear from. Our first example of giving goes all the way back to the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 4. Dealing with Cain and Abel. That's the first example. Genesis 4, 3 through 5. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So when God rejected Cain's offering, what did Cain do? He got mad. Who is God to be telling me how much I am to give 
or who is God to be telling me what kind I am to give or the quality I am to give. Who is God to tell me that? And he got mad because God accepted of the offering of Abel. He didn't want anybody telling him what to do. It was his whatever crops that he brought and him to do with what he wants to do. And for God to accept Abel's over mine, that just doesn't make sense. And he got mad and we know the rest of the story. Now we don't know why God rejected Cain's offering. Don't know if it's the wrong kind. Don't know if it's the wrong quantity. Don't know if it's the wrong quality. Don't know if it's how Cain gave it. Maybe Cain gave it with an attitude that, well, what does God need this for? I don't, we don't know. All we know is he accepted Abel, he rejected Cain's, but we see the response that Cain had. And that's the response we don't want to have when we have lessons such as this. It's in Hebrews 11 verse 4 which speaks of Cain and Abel where Abel gave a more excellent sacrifice. So there, there we see God's accepting of that uh, because it was a more excellent sacrifice. And uh, there's our first example of giving, and there were problems with it. Not with one, but with the other one. There were problems with it. Now when it comes to God and our, and our giving back to Him, God will bless us according to how well we give. Now that may sound like something you find out here on a, a television preacher. You know, you give this amount, and boy, here come the blessings. Yeah, that, that may sound like it, but, but 1 2 Corinthians 9, 6 mentions something of that. But I say to you, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So the Lord here says, you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. We understand that. You go out here, you own, a, you own a lot of tomatoes, you plant one tomato plant, you're going to reap in a sparingly way. Because after the worms get a hold of it and the, and the plague gets a hold of it, you may only get one tomato off the vine, who knows. But we understand that. But if you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. You're going to have more. Now, let's not just think about this is money. All of God's blessings and all the ways he blesses us. Sometimes we just focus on the money. But it's all the blessings that God does, and he does a lot of them for us. And it says if you, if you sow sparingly, there'll be less. If you sow in a bountiful way, there'll be more. And that's what he's showing here. There was a father once that was going to teach his son about giving. And he gave his son a weekly allowance. And he told his son, I want you to give, you know, some of your allowance Sunday to church. And the son said, well, how much? And dad said, that's up to you. Just know that God will bless you. And the amount you give, he'll bless you even back more. Well, the dad had a plan. Well, here goes the son, and the plate comes around, and the son puts in a nickel. Okay, a nickel. Church is over. They go back home, and the dad says, I appreciate what you did putting in the nickel. Here's your dime. I'm going to double your blessing for what you did. And the son says, you mean if I put in $5, you'd give me $10? And, and he said, yeah. Again, God blesses us in the same way, according to 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6. He will do that. So, take 2 Corinthians 9 6 in the right way and realize what the Lord wants us to do, how we can be blessed even more by God by what He says. When we move on to verse 7, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, he, we have more detail about this. So let, let, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Look at the word purpose. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart. And the word there means you choose beforehand what you're going to do. You have made a choice beforehand 
This is how much I'm going to give. It's not that you're wondering, well, I don't know about this week or that week. Or, no, you've already made a decision beforehand what you're going to do. So that's how the word purpose comes, comes from. Now, I know we, we hear everybody gives either cash or, or a check. That's generally how it gives, it's given. But what if we decided we're going to start up a, uh, a draft? at the bank. No more cash. No more checks. Here's the, you, you purpose now how much you want to give and you sign the forms and every week or once a month that amount's coming out. Would you be alright with that? Why not? Uh, there are churches here in, in Vernon that do that. I'm not they, they go to people, we got to have this amount. I want you to purpose in your heart this amount. And, and they signed it, and, and there it goes. Whether they're there or not, it still comes out. Would we be okay with that? If not, why not? If we're going to purpose this, how much I'm going to give, then that's how much we should be giving. What we should do. Uh, We commit to other things. We purpose to other things. You have, if you have a house payment or ever had a house payment, would you not purpose, I'm going to set aside this amount of money this month to pay my house payment? You got a new car or a car of some sort to cut a loan, have you not purposed, I'm going to set aside this amount for my you know, car payment or whatever payment? We do it other ways. Shouldn't we be doing it when it comes to our supporting of the church? We should do it that way. Well, I got to go on vacation. You know, I need I need vacation money, or I need this for for my kids or whatever. Well, why not just go ahead and take it out of your house payment? Why not call the bank? Oh, I got to go on vacation, so I'm not going to make my car payment this month. I'm going to use that for fun and vacation. How would they handle that? What would they think about that? We understand that. But yet, when it comes to the church sometimes, well, I'm going here or there, I got this. And so often, it's the contribution that gets left out. And we might say we'll make it up. Maybe we do. We should. But sometimes we might not. Well, I spend it. Again, if we purpose it in our heart, here's what I'm going to do, then that's what we are to do. That's what we are to do. That's the Lord talking here. That's Him talking. So, let's, let's look at it from a, what He says here. Purpose, what I have chosen beforehand, that's what I'm going to continue. Somebody gets paid once a month. They would have to give it on, the, I guess, the first day of the week after they get paid. You can't give what you don't have. After prosper. Yeah. Well, go, go above the mouth. If you make more money this week, I have purposed this amount. If I, for some reason, get overtime, make more money, go above. Go that second mile. Yeah. Yeah, well, if you set it out on a weekly draft, it's going to be taken out on a Monday. I don't know. I'm just, I know they'll do a monthly draft. Weekly, I don't know. I'm not a, never asked about it. Yeah. That's the example we have. What about the person who gives once a year? 
They look at all of it and they put it in there. They give it on the first day of the week. They know what their income is going to be for that whole year because the way it's set up, maybe CDs, we'll say, or whatever. They're going One big income a year. Or put your health in there. Money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, weekly would be. Mm-hmm. Never ever overpaid. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. It's okay to overshoot. Yeah. You won't hurt anything. <laughs> The next word in 2 Corinthians 9, 7 is the word grudgingly. He said don't do it in a a grudgingly way. Uh, God did not give us an amount in the New Testament of how much to give. It leaves that up to us. Sometimes the word tithing is used. That's an Old Testament word. It's not a New Testament word. It's an Old Testament. And And the Jews tithe. They were commanded to give around 30%. 10% of the money went in. 10% of the cattle or livestock went to the temple. And 10% of the grain went to the temple. Around 30%, maybe a little more. He told them how much. He just tells us, don't give in a grudgingly way. Don't do that. In the temple, there, when it came to that 10% of the money that they had to give, in the temple there were, there were two baskets or chests, or I don't know what they really called them. There was one that you put the 10% in that you had to give, and there was one that you would put your alms in, which is above the 10%. If you had a better week, or if you wanted to give more to help, maybe the alms were going toward helping the needy. You want to give more to it, you put it in that box over here. And it was that box was really the one that the more the more of a free will offering went into there, into the alms box. Because you want to see help, you went above and beyond what you wanted to do. And the word grudgingly is very closely related to covet covetousness. Covet, covetousness. Get the word out. Very closely related. 
So if I'm giving this money in a grudgingly way, that means I got covetousness in my heart. And he's saying, don't do that. Be thankful that you can give and that it's going for good, good works. It's going to help individuals in different ways. But uh, don't be in a grudgingly way giving of your means to the work of the church, or the work of the Lord. The next word in verse 7 there is the word of necessity. That's by force. Don't let, don't let anybody force you to do such. You don't want that. You're going to have to give this amount. Why? Well, because I'm telling you to. Now, that's the wrong way of doing it. It's to be from my heart. It is to be given. And nobody's going to twist my arm, or we shouldn't have to twist anybody's arm to make them have a change of attitude as to how much. I want to give this amount because that's what I want to do. What I want to do. So it's not to be done of necessity. You have to do this. Nobody's going to force you to do it. Again, again, that's coming uh, again out of the wrong, out of the wrong way from the heart. If that be the case. And then there in verse seven, the other word is cheerful. For God loves a, a cheerful giver, one that enjoys it, one that wants to do it, loves to do it, love giving back what God has given to me. And the Greek word there. It's also a word that we have in English called hilarious. That's just hilarious. That's more than just cheerful. Hilarious is a person who is very happy. And here's a person, God loves a hilarious giver. One who is very happy. Oh, here it is. I wish I could do more. I love giving and it just, it just uh, lifts their heart to be able to give. That's the kind of giver that the Lord wants right there. Uh, we don't want to miss heaven because we give in the wrong way. We don't want to miss that. So if we'll have used this, be a cheerful giver, look at it from the standpoint nobody's making me give or I'm giving in a grudgingly way and I have a uh, have this purpose in my heart is to be a man or whatever, then we'll, we'll, be, we'll have a much more of a cheerful attitude about us if we'll do that. Another thing about giving, giving is investing. You're investing in your spiritual future, and that would be heaven. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. <clears throat> Money has a way of distracting us. Uh, God wants us to give to keep us from worshiping money. Because we can become our idol. And God wants us to give so that will not happen. And it's not the money itself that's bad, that's evil, but it's the, what the money can provide that sometimes can distract us. That's what the, where the problem comes in. How much do we spend every year protecting our valuables? How much we spend every year protecting against a, uh, what they call it, a act of God, weather, tornadoes, or floods, or how much do we spend protecting our stuff? How much do we spend each year trying to protect our soul? Well, about that amount. Uh, again, we, we see, well, I got to protect my treasures on earth. What, I, what am I doing to in a sense, protect my soul from what this money can possibly do, how it can lead me astray. You can often tell a person's heart by their conversation. Just listen to them a while, talking, you can tell where the heart is. 
I remember we uh, lived in South Alabama. The day we moved down there, unloading, had the next door neighbor. He comes over, introduces himself. In that conversation, the first time I see the guy, he tells me how much money he's got. He's a very, I'm a very a pretty wealthy man, well off and retired, got money, this and this and this. I didn't ask him. Why did he tell me that? Well, that's where his heart was. That's where his heart was. If we didn't have eyes, how valuable would a diamond be? If we didn't have eyes, how valuable would gold be? Could you tell gold, a piece of gold from just a regular rock? If we didn't have eyes, how valuable would certain clothing be? Our eyes have a way of deceiving us and thinking, look at here, look at this. Again, let's just be careful that we don't get distracted by what money can buy and it carries us away from the Lord. So we want to invest in heaven. And then we have in Matthew 13, the parable of souls. It shows how Riches can deceive, deceive us, deceitfulness of riches. That one seed, and look at verse 7, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked it. Then in verse 22, when Christ explains that particular soil, now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. The soil was good. The seed was good. Uh, the seed was properly covered. The seed germinated and came up. But what failed to happen here, the briars and everything else weren't handled. And you got to get in there with, with a hoe and, and get those briars out and the weeds out or it'll choke it. That's what failed right here. That's where this individual failed. The deceitfulness of riches. It's deceitful. You got this, you'll be all right. You got this, you'll be satisfied. It'll make your life easier. And no more do we get it, and then we're not. We've got to keep the weeds trimmed back. Uh, you'll never be able to root them all out. I don't care how much uh, weed killer you spray. They're still going to, they will come back because there's more seeds in the ground. It's going to spring back up. So we've got to keep a, a look on this and make sure that we're not deceived and thinking this is it and keep our, keep our focus. A lot of folks, a lot of individuals have, have, a, have a lot of misery because of the deceitfulness of riches. Uh, inheritance can cause a problem in families. Who gets what? Gets divided, not divided equally, so they think. And a lot of problems. And, uh, we don't want that. We don't want that. Again, we've got to keep our thoughts on the right thing. People think the lottery is, what it, is where it's at. And so many of them, they win the lottery, and they're in worse shape financially, and they were before they won it. They're very deceitful, very deceiving it can be. So there's lesson one on uh, our giving. We're going to talk about it more next week and probably have a total of three lessons on it, I think. But, but let's take what the Lord says about it and take it to heart and let's not get mad at God or or anybody else, but uh, examine ourselves. As the Lord says, examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. Examine ourselves to do what is right. Can't take it with us. We use, put to a lot of good that we can here to try to get as many people into heaven as we can and help others along the way. Any other comments or thoughts on this? All right, thanks for your attention, your comments. Always a 
I got a lot of comments on this one. I'll just deal with our money. And that's just, uh, just the way we are about it. 